shakalaka. Woo! What's going on? Hey, in the past, if you followed me very long and supported me, I really appreciate it. If you've come at me and argued with me and a difference of opinion, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And you were semi-respectful. I've talked a lot about fitness and fat loss and leanness and bodybuilding competition, ripped abs, and, you know, your waistline determines your attitude and your attitude de determines your altitude. We want to live stronger and longer. But I'm 53 now. I've evolved. I lost my father. I've lost some friends, uh, some suicides, some lack, some loss. And you know what? Things change. And so I want to talk today about my lessons learned about my father, Ken Steen, passing and some lessons learned. So I hope this comes out good and, and it's valuable. It is it sure as hell is for me. So I'm Dr. Joe Mercola's uh, holistic trainer, uh, celebrity trainer, 25 million views on YouTube for his holistic trainer on Mercola.com. That's besides my 22 million views on my site. I'm the number one trainer in the world for Lifetime Fitness, the fastest growing fitness company in the world, 2001, 2005. Buy my dream car, Millennium Yellow Convertible Corvette, got the half a million dollar home in Frankfurt, and poof, the stress of being an entrepreneur, raising a family with a personal trainer, career, and overspending my money, and a, 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 a family that just disintegrated, and just bam, it's all gone. I can't, I can't think, I, can't, I, lo I lose my, my business, I got stolen from me. I tried to sell it and salvage it. It got stolen from me. I couldn't support myself, couldn't feed myself. I couldn't work out. I lost my house, my cars. I lost my money. I had no money. 401k was gone. Building the little nest you know, for the family was silly to do. The bank owned everything. They came back and got everything. I'm at rock bottom. My buddy Dave Stinnett lets me stay in his a condo for a full year. I stayed in bed for a full year. Then he said, finally, it's time to go. And I'm floating around, don't know what the hell I'm gonna do. I finally go live with mommy and daddy down in Bourbon, Illinois. 45 years old, goes from you know beating my chest, alpha male, you know, boom, do this, do that, to going to live with mommy and daddy. My dad was sick, advanced emphysema. And I started to be needed. And I helped my mother, I helped my father. And my dad's in the hospital, he's miserable, he's on all kinds of drugs, and he's basically having a nervous breakdown because he knows he's going to die in the hospital. And I pull my mom outside, and I say, Mom, it was a decision I had to make in one day. I said, Mom, I said, let's bring him home. Let's bring him home. And she says, no, I can't juggle his 8 to 10 meds, blood sugar, diabetes. I can't control him. And I said, yes, we can. And we did. And I'm so glad that we made that decision because that next year was glorious at communicating with my dad. We had fun. We played catch. One of the funnest things I've ever done in my life is play catch in the backyard with my dad, like Field of Dreams. It will melt my heart every time. And we played catch several times. We flew helicopters in the room. We laughed. And I said, had conversations with my dad that everybody would want to have with their loved one that was dying. And it was glorious. He decided that there was a God, that he was going to have eternal life. And that was awesome. And in that year, I felt needed. I was contributing to someone else. I got my freaking mind off of my shit. And he died peacefully. The last day, I knew it was different. Wheeled him into the kitchen in the wheelchair. Couldn't drink. Couldn't eat. Couldn't talk. Wouldn't take his pills. I had, For six months, I've been saying, Dad, it's okay. Let go, buddy. Where are you going to go when you die? And he always would look down and... And because he started talking about the bad things he did. And I said, Dad, the thief on the cross did bad things. But the last 10 minutes of his life on that cross, he got eternal life. It doesn't matter. I didn't tell you how sinful I was, the bad things I did. Everybody's the same. Come on, Dad. It's okay. And the, for the first time that last day, the only thing he said, I swear to you, he looked over his shoulders, eyes over at the counter. When I said, Dad, where are you going when you die, buddy? Instead of this and start and confess all of his sins and what he did wrong to my mother. And I said, Dad, that's okay. Mom, let it go. It's no big, it's nothing. And he, that last day, he looked over his shoulder and he says, I said, Dad, where are you going, buddy, when you die? It's okay. He looked over his shoulder with his good posture up and he says, the pearly gates. And I was like, oh my God. I barely got him into his bedroom around noon or one. 
his stomach was going in and out because he had no lungs at all. And his head was going like this. And it, it was miserable to watch. I laid him down, his eyes closed. He never opened up again. So six, seven o'clock at night comes and we're just so scared and worried with like, because his stomach's going like this and finally starts to slow down. We're like, this is good. And then around eight o'clock, nine o'clock, we're like, he's dying. So I said, mom, let's call hospice. Hospice walks in, we're all around him. Two minutes, she's there, puts his, her ear up to his nose, or his chest, takes his pulse. Two, three minutes, she's there. He's like, he's passed. The feeling was uplifting. It, I don't know if I saw light. I felt light. It was like amazing. It was awesome. And not in a weird way. So two, three days later, I'm at the gym, Fitness Premier in Bourbon, Illinois, working out. I see the hospice nurse. I go up to the hospice nurse. I gave him a big hug. said, thank you so much, man. You guys are unbelievable. And I said, do you believe in God? He looked at me and he, he laughed. And I said, what's so funny? He said, everybody who works for hospice believes in God because of what we see on a day in and day out basis. There's no way there's not a, a God and there's an afterlife. There's not an afterlife. And I was like, wow, you're right. So incredible. So about two weeks later, I had my dad's truck. I bought my dad's truck from him from, with a mom, mom loan, no interest. And for the last year, my dad's like, my dad kept his trucks clean, spick and span, and his whole life. And he was so proud of his new trucks. He'd get every three or four years. That was one of his little pleasures. And so every time I'd pull up in the truck, it was dirty, and I felt bad. And he's like, give me back my keys. Because, you know, it's hard losing transportation the last years of your life. He said, you better clean that truck. And I was so busy, I never did clean it very often. And he would just not be happy about that. So about three, two, three weeks after his passing, I go to the, I go to the uh, Foolish Car Wash, and I clean it, and I'm waxing it. They wax it, and I'm, I'm drying it off. And it's looking really good. It's a nice truck, a Ford Explorer. It's a $30,000 truck. And I just got this nice little feeling in my heart. And my dad would be so happy. I, I, I didn't call my mom yet. It was, the sun was going down. And there was just sparkles on the truck. It looked beautiful. Two or three days before, someone had sent me uh, angels, uh, pennies from your angel, your guardian angel. I'll put it down below. And it basically says that our loved ones can't communicate to us in the way that we're used to when they die and go to the afterlife, but they can communicate to us in ways that we're not aware of. And a penny on the floor may be them trying to communicate to you. It's a really cute little poem down there that melted my heart when I saw it. I got it sent to me about three days earlier. So I'm cleaning my car and I, I call my mom and I'm like, mom, I'm getting emotional. I'm like, dad's happy. He's smiling in heaven because his truck's effing clean. And it was so emotional. And I look down on the ground and I see a freaking penny. And it, the sun hits it and it's glistening. I pick that penny up and I absolutely know my dad, Kenny Steen, my best buddy of all time, said, thank you for cleaning my truck. I put it in my pocket and I told my mom. She started crying and I've never, ever walked past a penny since or nickel or dime. I picked that stuff up and I talked to my dad. So there's my story. I hope you liked it. Um, what I thought was the worst thing in life, Darren Steen, Mr. Stallion Stud Alpha Male Personal Trainer of the Year, loses everything, goes home to live with mommy and daddy. I had my tail between my legs. I wasn't on social media. I did not want to see anybody. I didn't want to live. But guess what? I didn't give up. I almost gave up. I never put the Glock 45 to my head, but I was checking insurance policies, and I called my buddy Randy Harris in one day before I went down to live with my mom and dad, and I made a decision. I didn't pull the trigger, and he took the gun, and he didn't put me in the psych ward because he was that close to. I didn't know what else to do. But the worst thing in my life, or what I thought was the worst thing in my life, turn into the, the best thing. Because I'll tell you what, you honor your mother and father and you'll live a great life. I firmly believe that. And my dad is smiling. And when I check out on my, of my life today or in 30 years preferably, because I got a lot of good to do, I gotta, I'm going to have a big smile on my heart because I did my mom and dad right. I honored them. So if you're going through something in your life and you think it's bad, guess what? Don't give up. 
because rock bottom is a new firm foundation to rebuild your effing best life. I love you. You do have the power to change to make the rest of your life the best of your life. I love you.